Sandin. And really excited to be here with all of you today also. Um, we, uh, like Brandon said, we are about to get started on our, our first presentation with you about um, what we can do in our dissertation teaching remotely. So um, we also have Kelly Schultz here with us from our ELA department, and she is helping us out with this presentation today. Is there anything else I need to add to that, Brandon, that you would like to share? I was just starting to see that some people are saying that they cannot hear um, the presentation. So I'm not quite sure why that would be. Um, because we have other people who can hear. So um, that's interesting. All right, we have lots of people who are saying that they can hear. So if you are um, unable to hear, I would recommend logging out and logging back in. I'm not sure if there was something strange that I did when I muted all participants or something, but uh, we definitely want you to participate. And um, there are closed captions for anyone who um, cannot hear or is having a difficult time with our audio. Hopefully you'll be able to follow along with the closed captioning. All right. And we'll just add that if if you are unable to join in a conversation and you would like to jot any of your um, additional ideas or comments in the chat, you can do that as well. Typically, GoToMeeting opens up in a separate um, window. So if you're still looking at the, the screen on your browser with the green check that says, have a great meeting, um, there should be a separate window that is actually playing and um, this broadcast. So um, we hopefully will be able to work those things out and we'll go ahead and move into our conversation, which we sort of just did this. <laughs> yeah. So um, yes, again, so through some of the housekeeping stuff, um, just just as a reminder, make sure that you you can hear us and you can see what's going on on the page, and then make sure that you are muted unless um, you are participating in a comment. If you have any specific questions, then go ahead and put those in the chat as well. Okay. So for certificates of participation, at the end of the session, you will. Um, receive a link to complete the feedback form. So you will not get that um, full uh, credit until the end of the session or the link until the end of the session so that you're able to complete that form. You must fill that form out today. Um, and then when you complete the form, you will be sent a link that you can then use to print or save to get your certificate. Um, we cannot issue any certificates. They will that will come directly from that link. And for any questions, just go to that email at nclearnstogether at gmail.com. And I'm gonna actually turn my camera on really quickly here so you all can see me as well. Okay, so for CEO uh, questions, um, some of those might be how much credit will you You'll receive 0.1 CE equal to one contact hour. Um, the type of credit that you'll receive is up to your school district, um, and you'll follow that that process with your school district. And each school and district has their own policy and procedure. So, again, that's not up to us directly. That is up to your school and your district. How will you receive the credit? Um, you must attend this live session, and we do encourage that you participate, share as much as possible, and then at the end of the session like we said you will receive um, the feedback attendance and feedback form to get that credit um, today we are also going to be looking since this is related to the digital learning standards um, the standard that we are specifically focusing on is 
students use technology to seek feedback that informs and improves their practice and to demonstrate their learning in a variety of ways. So you can learn more about the other standards um, if you go to the, the Digital Teaching and Learning website. So a couple of more um, housekeeping things. So we will give you a few updates about DPI just in general, um, and your videos are not necessary. Um, we do ask that you try to stay on topic if at all possible and use the chat for your questions. We are trying to stay very solutions focused in this. So yes, there, there are some things that we are trying to overcome and some obstacles, but we are really looking at what are the solutions and what are the exciting things that we can talk about to overcome these and work through them. And we're gonna try to stay as much on time as possible and be um, respectful of your time, um, but, but we have a lot of exciting things to talk about. Um, again, please make sure you self-mute. There is closed captioning if you cannot hear us for any reason. All right. So, um, Sorry, y'all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, is there any way, Brandon, that you could just mention this, talk about this slide for one second? Sure. So yours actually might look a little bit different because um, GoToMeeting was updated, at least on my end, since the last time you or we used these slides. Um, on your navigation sort of toolbar thing, you should see a, um, a, a dot with the microphone symbol. And if it's green, it means you're unmuted. And if it's red, it means you are muted. And you can feel free to yell at the cat or remind your children to go to sleep and take a nap the way that mine should be right now. So feel free to self-mute, but also as we are continuing through our conversation today, um, do unmute yourself so that you can, uh, so that we can hear all the great things that you all are doing. So since we um, are, it's completely impossible for us to um, be able to do any sort of icebreaker with 90 people in the room. Whoop, whoop, can you believe we've got 90 people? That's amazing. Um, we've got a little icebreaker game here. And so um, we have 12 different zoom up pictures of famous paintings by famous um, uh artists, visual artists. So if you could just grab a small scrap of paper and um, as soon as we say go, write down A through L and then identify the artist who painted these um, without cheating, no Google, uh, and we'll see how many you can get right and we'll, we'll have a little friendly competition here. So uh, go ahead and grab a scrap paper and on your mark, get set, Go. 60 seconds. I tested my wife earlier and she did pretty well. I'm impressed for a non arts person non-arts teacher, I should say. You have 30 seconds left. Fifteen! Get in those last ones! All right, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, pencils down. All right, so here are the answers. A is obviously Andy Warhol, B is Frida Kahlo, C is Pierre Mondrian, D is Leonardo da Vinci, E is Vincent van Gogh, F is Edvard Munch, G is Norman Rockwell. You gotta love that Sunday evening, Saturday Evening Post um, sort of, uh, He's just so iconic for H is Mary Cassette. Eight I is uh, I am going to try not to but butcher just this Ketsushika Hokusai. J is George O'Keefe. K is Grant Wood, and L is Pablo Picasso. So 
Um, in order for us to kind of test out our capabilities here for um, participating in our polls later on, we're going to go ahead and ask everybody to go to um, or participate in a poll right now. And uh, I thought it would be funny if there was a fishing poll or anyway, moving on. Um, so if you could please go to um, pollev.com slash Brandon Rhoda 010 written up there at the top and I'll drop it into the chat one more time. Um, and then just choose whichever or however many you got right. Did you get one to two or sorry, zero to two, right? Three to six, seven to nine or 10 to 12. Nice job, Lisa, with 11, correct? That's awesome. I just dropped the um, link into uh, the chat as well. So, wow, we got a lot of people who got half right and a lot of people who got all of them right. So, nice job, Melissa, getting them all. It would worry me if you didn't get them all, so that's wonderful. Great. Um, we're going to go ahead and um, move into the next poll and ask you what subject do you teach? Now, before you do this, um, please try to stick to saying dance, art, theater, or music, because if, you, uh, if those are the subjects that you teach, um, just because this changes and adds a whole bunch of other things if you break them up. 12. It must be 12th grade. Awesome. Lots of music teachers. I like that. It, you know, it gets bigger based on how many people participate. All right. Cool. Wonderful. Glad to see so many people. It says it's full and is not letting um, anybody Participate. Um, by the way, I see a lot of people dropping things into the chat. Um, we are, oh, because the poll is full. I gotcha. I gotcha. Hopefully this continues to work. Good. All right. So we're looking at what level do you teach? So. Gosh, it's already as full. I wonder if there's a capacity on the, uh, on the free um, poll app. I'm sure there is. We've got lots of elementary folk, but go ahead and drop your answers into the chat if you've got anything. Lots of music. Awesome. Wonderful. Great. It's always a learning adventure, right, with new technology? Okay. So I'm going to hand everything back over to Sayward, and um, she is going to help lead us through our conversation today. All right, excellent. So um, we are going to go through four different things with you. We're going to start with just a little overview of a standards-based approach and really how we approach that with remote learning and remote teaching. And then we're going to talk about what is working right now. We're really going to focus on those positives, what we can do, what is working. And then looking at sort of the next steps, how can we help you? What do you need from us? Um, how do we share resources with each other? And then closure at the end. And we, but you can obviously contact us and get in touch with us again. So we're going to start with um, our standards-based approach. So of course, all of our arts are based on these standards. Um, from the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. And there are um, a few that we probably normally focus on a little bit more with the our class. There are a few that um, probably get the majority of, of our attention. And then there's a few that might get a little bit left on the back burner here and there. So you want to sort of take inventory and look at, you know, what are the things that you've already been able to really cover and that you might normally spend your time and attention focusing on? And then what are some of the ones that you really haven't had a whole lot of opportunity to dive into yet or dive deeper into? And which ones might be really um, benefiting 
um, or useful to use in learning time period. So which ones can you use more um, technology or independent work at home um, to be able to really tap into those teachers? So um, when we look at remote learning for the arts, instead of trying to replace what we were doing in the classroom and replicate that exactly now that we're at home, think about what can you do differently now. So it opens the doors for all sorts of new possibilities. And, you know, we really kind of pigeonhole ourselves when we think about trying to do something exactly the way it was done before. And then that just leads to frustration. So, you know, as educators, we're used to this unexpected interruption of fire drills and tornadoes and all of these things. We, we adjust, we change course, we adapt. We know how to take obstacles that are thrown at us and work with those obstacles to create something even better. So how do we use this to really create this new way of looking at how we do what we do? Um, so can we, can we look at our content now through a different lens as though we're putting on a different pair of glasses? We might see something a little bit differently than we did before, or we might notice something that we've never had a chance to notice before. Um, so really, really taking this as an opportunity to do that. So one thing you want to try to do is survey your students, obviously, you know, figure out some way of what resources do they have at home. So that's technology, but then also art wise, what, what things do they have at home? As far as instruments, do they not have instruments at home? So now we have to be even more creative with how we're going to look at music and and all of that. Do they have art that they can access to to analyze? Um, are, do they have CD players or can they access music on their computers? Um, do they have pastels, crayons, color pencils, whatever art supplies? And then, um, you know, even spaces to dance and move openly in. So that's another thing that you want to take inventory of and ask. Um, so this is a great time also when you have take an inventory of your students, but also looking at what you have. Do you have video and audio recording equipment that you need? Do you have a space set up that you can record yourself and be able to get that across to your students? So even if it's a temporary space that you can kind of move furniture around to be able to set it up so that it works for you, that's what you really want to take inventory and look at. This can also be a time that you can um, uh, share with your students um, some alternate ways of looking at things. You know, if they don't have enough art supplies in their home, can they go outside and gather supplies from nature and use those to create art with or recycled um, materials, um, you know, site-specific dance and working outside um, rather than a confined indoor space might, might work. Or create a list for your students of what to look for in a safe space. You wanna clear the furniture out of the way, clear, um, rugs and things that they can trip over. Um, my son's art teacher sent a list of how to create an art workspace in your home and what things that you want to look for and gather to create this artist studio. Um, so again, we want to look at, at, at our language and how we express what we're doing. So we can teach remotely, temporarily. We are very capable of doing this and the arts can be done in this way. We are very cautious and wary of sending any message that the arts are unable to be taught in a remote or reduced capacity. We're very, very cautious about sending that message out to our students, our parents, our colleagues, our community and administrators. We want to make sure that we are all using that language that is, this is possible, we can do this. Is it ideal? Not necessarily, but we wanna really promote that message that we can do this. Um, teaching remotely is better than not teaching at all. So really promote your successes and what you're able to do differently and creatively during this time. I was just speaking um, to, well, several um, different stakeholders and um, we were commenting on the, the new art education is essential document that was just shared on our um, Facebook page. And I will go ahead and drop it into the chat as well. 
Um, you know, there are lots of different states who are choosing to use their arts teachers as, uh, to help relieve the amount of um, students who are are in each classroom. Some health teachers are being used, sorry, health and PE teachers are being used as auxiliary um, nurses and such at different schools. And so um, I think it's a great time for us to say that North Carolina arts teachers can teach remotely, temporarily, because teaching remotely, you know, is better than not teaching at all, um, which is happening across the nation. So as Sayward said, for promoting your successes, um, the school board loves seeing great successes, success stories. So when you post things on your, um, in social media, please make sure to tag them. Uh, you know, you can tag your legislator, you can tag a lot of different um, entities that are making decisions right now. So uh, promoting your successes is always, always encouraged. Great. So with that, we're going to move on to what is working right now. Yeah, so again, really focusing on the positive, really using that language with our students, with our families that we're working with, um, focusing on what we can do right now, what is working, um, and what we can continue to do. So we're gonna go ahead and do another poll. This is gonna go ahead and drive the majority of our conversation um, for the remaining time. There are five different ideas here that we shared with you, um, and you can rank these. So you can arrow them up and arrow them down um, so that you can let us know what you'd like to focus on today. So again, if you go to pollev.com slash Brandon Rhoda 010, you should be able to rank these. Wonderful. This is great feedback. All right. It's staying pretty steady. So we'll say that we, uh, we'd like to talk about imagining some fault scenarios. Um, oh, there we go. We just hit capacity. Uh, to get new ideas, and then we'll talk a little bit about performance ensembles. It seems like most people are um, pretty set on sharing your own success and addressing the lack of supplies. So I will say that if you do have successes and links that you'd um, to virtual art shows I've seen already be shared in the chat, um, I know a lot of times I, you know, when I was in the classroom, I simply just wanted to know how somebody did something and then I took off from there. So um, if you'd like to share your successes, the best way to do so might just be in the um, in the chat. Thank you, Shelly. That's perfect. So it's time to share. Um, we'll go ahead and talk a little bit about some fall scenarios. Um, I recently just um, saw that a, uh, I, I don't remember which, um, it was uh, Ed Surge, I'm sorry, it said po four possible scenarios. We could either start online and go, um, go into the brick and mortar when it's safe. We could start in the brick and mortar and jump out to remote learning as soon as um, it, it seems unsafe. We could go completely online or we could do some sort of blended learning that's um, a day, B day sort of thing right from the get go. Uh, I am going to preface this entire conversation by saying that Sayward and I have no information whatsoever about what the fall looks like. Um, we are simply uh, just here to facilitate you all brainstorming. So um, we will try this and we will try to just, you know, 
use our best manners and and uh, so I will go ahead and open up the floor and hopefully people can unmute themselves and we'll go ahead and start with a scenario of um, starting online and then transitioning into the brick and mortar classroom how do you how do you see um, yourself setting up your students and yourself for success Brandon, can I say something? Absolutely, thank you. I was just thinking that, like going back, it's essential that we start day one with the technology so that when the kids go back home, they can be kind of the teachers for their parents because the number one thing I saw while teaching online was that the parents didn't know how to access everything. And so then everything was kind of gridlocked. Like, okay, well, you literally, I, I literally teaching 630 students, I was literally teaching all of these parents how to access their child's Google account, which seems simple to us, but it's not when you use it every day. And so I'm really going to try to start with technology day one, because as an art teacher, I'm always kind of like, oh, yeah, I'll do the technology part as kind of a subsidiary. Like, you know, I have stations where kids can go to do it. But for me, I think it's really important that I, I want paintbrushes in their hands and oil pastels. So I think that that's a new way of looking at it that I need to start training my littles so that they can do it independently. That's great. Yeah, I think that the, the heart of what you're saying is that, you know, there needs to be an opportunity that the technology is taught in isolation as as the student objective for the day. Um, and I agree. I know that when I taught online, I would first teach the technology. You know, there's a unit zero, basically, that was just to ensure that everybody knew what's going on. In fact, um, I know that Sayward is just coming out of teaching in a blended environment for uh, three different universities. So she might be able to speak to some of her success. Yeah, I mean, um, I was I was teaching at three different universities. Everybody had different technology and different uh, programs that they were using, um, but really trying to set up from the very beginning um, what you would expect of your students. I know we didn't have a ton of time to do that, but before we left for spring break, we sort of prepared the students that this is the technology that you're going to need to have to be able to videotape yourself and record and upload. We did sort of YouTube video tutorials, just anything we could do a crash course quickly so that they knew that they could get information back and forth to us. Um, and of course that's that's college age students. So they're doing that on their own, but it's, um, you know, a lot of them, it was their first time ever using any, any of those uh, programs or those ways of learning. It was very different for them to be learning uh, dance at home, um, but but it ended up working and, and becoming really successful and they were able to get a, a, a different scope rather than just technique class. Um, they were really able to think more broadly about dance as a whole. Um, so yeah, hopefully that helped answer a little bit. <laughs> And then something that I've seen a lot of people do, including my own child's school, is to set up those times to um, teach parents in the evening after their work is done, holding a you know 6.30 or 7 o'clock um, time period where parents can come in and you can do an office hour sort of drop in for tech help. Um, and of course, recording those and sending them out as well. I, I would add as a parent that that is very helpful um, to be able to have that sort of time to ask questions with the teacher because, you know, as parents, we're trying to be at home and do our work and also help our students or our children. And so it's hard to be able to get onto those programs and be learning how to use the technology at the same time as getting our own work complete. And so I think really having sort of those tutorial times in the evening after work hours are really um, helpful. Yeah. Lois Paris um, was just sharing that uh, it would be helpful for a, a school um, to have, or, or the entire continuum, to have a common LMS. And um, 
I completely agree. You know, if a parent is trying to teach one child in one LMS and one child in another LMS, that's that's too much. Um, and then, uh, unfortunately, a lot of those decisions are made by people with higher pay grades than uh, those of us on this call. So um, communicating that need, I think, right now across the summer is the thing that's probably going to help the most. Um, with decisions that are going to be made over the summer for the fall. And I, I will say, um, you know, at a few of the universities I was teaching at, they were looking at scenarios for the fall as well of, you know, even if there's not policy, you know, of how many students can be in the classroom at one time, how do we really take ownership in the classroom of, of keeping the the social distancing and and keeping um, every everyone safe while also still facilitating a sense of community um, and so you know trying to give students their designated spaces within the classroom and then finding ways for them to still share or collaborate without having to be close together um, so you know those are things ways that you can kind of think think outside the box. Um, in, in creating that that community feeling right from the beginning so that when they when it when and if we do have to go back to online teaching um that they really establish that sense of community within the, the students um so two things really fast apologies for the jargon lms means learning management system and it could be anything from power schools learning to canvas to um, being able to use Google Classroom or even flat.io for any music theory teachers, um, anything like that. I do want to quickly show you, um, and I'm going to, oh, and Seesaw. Yes, Seesaw for the littles. Um, North Carolina and um, State University's Friday Institute and the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction both share or create work together to come up with a remote learning um, and remote teaching framework. And um, I think that this is brilliant. I think it's really important for us to take time to look at this. Um, and if your administration doesn't seem to be aware of this, there's also a, um, a framework for instructional leaders and, and teachers. So, um, this instructional, you know, instructional time expectations, how to connect to families and students, student engagement aligned to standards, equity, equity, choice and flexibility, how to give feedback on student work, collaboration among students, and um, SEL. These, uh, it, it gives a great, a great um, description of how to get into these. There's a one-page summary and there's a complete report. Even the complete report is not very long, but the one-page summary is great at least to get the juices flowing. Um, I think that this is a wonderful resource that has been undershared. I did share it out on our listserv, which by the way, if you have not joined our listserv, please do so. Uh, you'll find the links on the very first page of the slide. And, um, and it's absolutely absolutely beyond a doubt worth taking a look at this to start to frame um, what remote learning, remote instruction and remote learning might look like if ever it happens again. Which let me say, just take a, a second um, to say that we, we, so there, are, there are different districts across the entire nation who have been using remote instruction plans forever. Um, you know, there are places in our country that have so many snow days every single year that they have already um, instituted remote learning plans. And those are not necessarily digital learning plans, but they are remote learning plans. So um, LEAs have done this to great success across the entire country. So um, just a couple notes from the, um, from the chat. Quaver Music is, a, is another good um, LMS platform for music and they are doing some, um, if you search what they're doing, opening up during COVID, they uh, released more like mini units for the entire thing. Um, Barb is pointing out that you, you need to check to see what your district has approved. And I will echo that saying that it is 
imperative that we protect the rights of our students during this time. Um, if you are unfamiliar with COPPA or FERPA, uh, make sure that you become uh, familiar with it because we, we need to be very aware of the fact that our, there are a lot of regulations um, limiting what we are allowed to ask our students to access. So. I'll also um, add just from my own experience because I was I was teaching um, several college courses remotely before any of this happened. So they were um, primarily distance based and a lot of the things that I would ask my students to do, I would give them um, lists of um, different options for the class and they were all of those things would fall under the objective or the standard that I was trying to achieve and so then it was a little bit easier based on the um, resources or or tools that each individual student had or where they were doing their work um, they could choose what best fit their own situation and scenario and then I um, would also have them do reflections at the end of Sometimes I would have students that didn't have the capability to record themselves, upload to YouTube, and send things back to me. Um, so I had to really rely on their own reflection of what they were learning and their ability to relay that to me. And a lot of times I felt like I was getting more out of the reflection and, and them processing what they were learning than me just sitting and watching a video of them doing it anyway. Um, so sometimes, you know, it's it's a it's a way of looking at how do how do we assess the same objective, but maybe in a different way than we had in our head that we needed to assess it. All right. I also saw one one time in the chat there somebody mentioned um, as a teacher having young kids at home yourself and trying to you know it, that was back to the maybe having tutorials in the evening. And how do you navigate that when you have your own kids to, to think about and worry about? And so maybe if it's a tutorial that you could record and then just upload and they could ask questions, but they could watch it on their own time later. And I'm going to just chime in here and say that as, as teachers and parents, like you have to focus on your kids, your own children. So, you know, you, you're really trying to navigate all of this. Um, and your students are very, very important to you, but you have to also keep in mind, you've got to do what's best for your family. And so sometimes that might mean streamlining something or making it a little bit simpler so that it leaves you time to do your responsibilities that you need to get done as well. So one thing that can be helpful there is synchronous versus asynchronous learning. Asynchronous means that you're doing it or you and your students are not necessarily meeting together. They're, everyone's doing it on their own time. Um, and I know that that is, is much more helpful um, when you have families, whether you are the student in grad school or whether you are the teacher teaching other um, people. So I see lots of chat about the cost of different LMSs. Um, <laughs> but here, uh, we'll go ahead and try some other um, other scenarios, other successes for the idea of, of starting online. Rebecca, could you actually, um, I'm intrigued by your live summer camp session for parents. Um, what, could you speak a little bit more to that? Yeah, it's just a idea that I had where things kind of get safer and this could be like an ongoing small sessions arranged by homerooms where the parents would come into the school and use the actual equipment the students are using because using a Chromebook is much different than if you have an iPad or you're used to a desktop or your laptop or some kids just work on full phone. And that way the parents in a face-to-face -face environment could learn how to do the basics of navigating the LMS and also a brief discussion about how to structure time 
for learning, distance learning at home, and some other strategies to help everybody be successful and to reduce some of their fear. Because a lot of the parents are just afraid to try and afraid they'll mess things up for their kid, you know? It's just a thought. No, that's a great idea. Yeah, I was, you know, coming from education when my daughter's teacher said, you know, log in with their Google account and get on to um, her Google Classroom. I said, okay, and I did it. But then so many other parents were confused because they have Chrome and that means they're automatically, you know, logged into their own Google account. So when they tried to access their child's Google Classroom, it had a very difficult time figuring out which account it was in and then they had to ask for permission. And so, yeah, a lot of those issues <laughs> that circumnavigated if you're able to just um, preempt it. Lois is talking about more training for parents in social emotional learning. Um, and I think that's really great. Uh, NAFME is doing quite a few and Arts Ed New Jersey are both doing a lot of work around this subject. Um, oops. And, um, and they're trying to figure out how to educate not just teachers but also um, parents. I just did a um, webinar with Crayola uh, about teaching SEL or creating an SEL game with your kid at home. So that's something that we can, you are more than welcome to share with any sort of, um, or any parents or stakeholders in your, uh, in your community. I personally am reading Scott Edgar's Social Emotional Learning and Music Education. I think I said that backwards, music education and social emotional learning um, and the artistically mindful classroom. And I'm hoping that we can have some book studies on these in the fall um, and, and find more ways to um, get into that subject. I'll, um, I'll, I'll just tap onto that with just two kind of specific examples. But um, I, I was teaching a lot of ballet classes, right? And so a lot of my students had a hard time thinking about how are we going to do ballet at home in this space and what are we doing and so i had to i had to tell them let's think broad and really expand our idea of what ballet is what do we do in the studio inventory of ourselves our body our emotions our headspace where we are on a given day and that it's different every day we analyze that and then we figure out what do we need to then meet the needs that we have on that given day and to get something accomplished and then we respond to those needs and we reflect on it so that's really our practice throughout the day at the ballet bar but then how do we just take that practice and apply it to something that might look a little bit differently at home but it's still the same the same order and the same sequence of steps so some days you know them taking inventory of how they were feeling was really more of journaling and writing and where am I feeling stuck and tension and anxiety and how do I work through those things and then what's going to make my body feel better and then how does that relate to the ballet that, that we're also talking about or learning about or watching a video that might stem um, into into what I'm feeling that on that given day so that's one example and then with my own kids I've done a lot of just art projects where like on Earth Day we went outside we gathered supplies from nature and we created self portraits using sticks and flowers and branches and whatever we could find but it kind of also let them see there was something more important going on um, it, there was a little bit of what they were feeling that was coming out in these self portraits um, when we first went into quarantine, we we did art projects related to lions, and we talked about being brave and that we can get through this. So all three of my kids did a different lion artwork, right? So um, you know you can really start to tie in what they're going through and what they're feeling into the specific project that you're having them do as well. Sorry, I'm just adding a whole bunch of. Uh, links in the chat. So if somebody else has, um, so we'll take this time just for a second to remind you that you don't need to frantically write any of these down or save them anywhere because our wonderful and amazing coworker Kelly Schultz is recording them at the end of this um, 
slide deck and we will read or that slide deck link is actually at the bottom of every slide. Um, I'll put it back up here in a minute when I'm done gathering all of the links and um, Oh, somebody was asking about CEUs for the webinar. The um, the web or the CEUs are not being given by us. They are being given by um, the the overarching uh, NC Learns Together organization. So you will be getting a, um, a link to a survey that takes you to another link to get your um, CEUs here at the end of our session. So um, given that we have about 10 minutes left, I'm thinking uh, we are going to probably um, continue on in our conversation a little bit. Uh, how do I share? There we go. Uh, just some other things that we are doing and thinking about at um, DPI. I hope you all enjoyed this time to share slide. I was dying laughing, but maybe that's just me and my dad jokes. All right, we'll do this. Six, well, maybe I'll only give you 30 seconds this time. Um, the first word is the music group name. So hopefully you can figure out A pretty easily. The second and the third pictures are the clues to the song. That was a lot of heavy stuff. So just as a brain mental break, um, and of course modeling what is good practice in, in the classroom uh, or the virtual classroom, uh, go ahead and grab a, sh a scratch sheet of paper and see how many of these you can name. We'll do 30 seconds and your time starts now. Your time is half up. You have 15 seconds. Sayward, I hope you're figuring these out too. All right. So um, the first one, of course, is Prince and Purple Rain. The B is Eagles Hotel California. C is Queen's Bicycle Race, um, which was the only one I got wrong when I did this because I couldn't figure I, I knew the song I was singing it in my head but I didn't know the name of the song so um the Rolling Stones Brown Sugar and Beach Boys Surfing USA so uh we figured we did a little bit of the uh visual arts world in the first one so we do a little bit of a different art form here um so we're gonna try that poll once more and see how many you got right this time Ooh, we did great on this one. I like to ride my bicycle. I like to ride my bike. All right, great job, everyone. Cool. <laughs> I'm going to hand it back over to Sayward now. Sorry, I'm muted there. So let's think about um, the next steps and how do we move forward? Um, so there's several things that you can do to stay in touch with us. You can always email us and ask us questions. We have our contact information. Um, we're happy to help brainstorm and bounce ideas off. Um, you know, and anything that you would like uh, more information on or you're feeling stuck then just feel free to reach out. We are we are happy to be there. That's what we're here for. Um, there's a few other uh, resources here. So we have an Arts Edge sharing Facebook group. Um, so you can go on to our Facebook page and look at that. Uh, we have a remote learning page, which has ideas of um, high and low tech options. Um, we are in the process of also revamping that. So if you have really great ideas or things that you've been doing that you want to send us, that would be awesome as well because we love to share that with other people. And we have um, a Google Classroom share space, which is a way a way that you can upload those things to share with each other. So that is um, right here. You can go into each of these different disciplines 
and share ideas that you have, lesson plans, things that you are doing in your own classes. But then you can also get ideas from all these other teachers who are sharing things as well. So this really uh, great shared resource to um, get inspired, share what's been working for you, share your successes, and again, what we can do and what what is working right now. I just wanted to share uh, two things. Number one, the North Carolina Museum of Art is all has already integrated Google Classroom buttons into all of their learning resources. Uh, the North Carolina Symphony is in the process of trying to figure that out. I had a meeting with them yesterday and um, they said they were still working on it. And um, these Google Classrooms have proven difficult for some teachers in different LEAs. Uh, it seems that a lot of LEA's tech departments kind of tightened up their um, their security settings when everybody went online. Totally understand that. Um, but if the at DPI NC gov domain is not whitelisted, you may not be able to join these classes with your school um, Google accounts. You would have to use a personal Google account in order to access these codes or sorry, these classes. Um, and then if you're not sure how to sign up for those Google Classrooms, if you go to classroom.google.com, um, you sign in, there's a plus that says click to add classes, and then you type in the strange code that's written here for dance, it's T-L-B-M-A-Y-J, and you should be able to get let into that class right away. NCMA is the best. Great, and then um, lastly, you know, we'd love to know how we can support you. We, um, Brandon's been doing all four arts disciplines for a little while on his own, and so I'm really happy to be here and be a team with him. Um, so we are, you know, wanting to know what more we can do for you as teachers and really how we can be here to support you. So we'd love your input, your feedback, um, you know, giving giving us um, ideas of what we can do with you. Would you like us to facilitate some coaching, you know, or help help with us? Um, connect, um, resources, following up with anything. So all all of these things, um, and especially um, SEL components. If you have um, questions regarding that, you know, we are doing a lot of research right now about how to how to incorporate these SEL components into all of the arts. So we're happy to, again, brainstorm and chat with you um, individually or more detailed if you would like to do that. So as a closure, we want to um, give you some contact information to continue to reach out to us. And again, hopefully you can continue sharing um, information from each other as well. Um, and with each other. Oh, all right, one last poll, uh, really simple. Just, it says, what else can we help you with? But also, what are you excited about? What did you get out of this? Um, it's an open-ended sort of poll. So um, anything that you'd like to give us feedback here or at, with here is super wonderful. And I'll let that go for, oh, just a minute. Um, to see if there's anything that we can respond to. And any of that is helpful. Anything that you can give us, what what you would still like to know, what you want to dive into, or again, like he said, what you're excited about moving forward in this new venture. Thank you for the feedback about having the arts on this platform, we were thrilled to be participating. So uh, specific platforms for choir, I know of not a single um, platform that anybody can get live um, singing done well on. All of those things that you see on the TV and online that are claiming anything different, those have been doctored in iMovie. Um, they just have. As soon as somebody creates it, you know it's going to be everywhere, and then it's going to um, explode, and they're going to make a million dollars. <laughs> so.
Awesome. Wonderful. Uh, is this something that you guys would like to continue to do perhaps monthly throughout the summer? You can just go ahead and put a chat or answer in the chat. Great. Somebody just um, wrote time to create art. Um, I totally hear you. It's I've loved the fact that I can save two hours at least every single day, and I've been getting to sit down at the piano, and it's actually been kind of amazing. So, cool. Standards for online instruction, quality matters. That's exactly right. Everything that you should be doing should still be standards-based. There's so much um, in the response and the critique and the contextual relevancy that are perfect for online um, I know what I always wanted all of my students to do research projects on um, music and the artist that goes along with it. Uh, this is a perfect opportunity to do so. So, wonderful. Training on learning platforms and digital tools. I will tell you that uh, there, all you have to do is look. Uh, if you Google anything, it's all, all there. And YouTube is amazing. I had to go do that for this poll ev. So. All right, let's go ahead and go on to what everybody actually came here for, which is the uh, the survey and the CEU certificate. <laughs> I'm dropping the um, the link into the chat, um, so please um, click on that Bitly NC Learns Together Arts Ed. Um, that is how you get to your survey. That survey has to be completed before you can receive your CEUs. Um, these, this is our contact information here. You click on the Facebook icon, uh, it'll take you to our page, same with Twitter and the Instagram. Um, that bit.ly link down at the very bottom, bit.ly slash we can NC arts ed is the link to this slide deck. And then the splatter with all four arts is the link, uh, that, that image is the link to, um, our Google page. Again, have to fill out the form today in order for the NC Learns Together crew to um, provide you with your CEU certificate. Um, at the end of this, you, when you get it, you'll be able to find the meeting notes. And as I said, our amazing colleague Kelly has been um, taking notes for us like crazy. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to our contact information, and I'll drop that link one more time into the chat. Thank you all so much for being here with us today, and hopefully, you know, you will continue to reach out, and if we are able to do these uh, monthly calls, I saw somebody mentioned uh, perhaps breaking them down by specific disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we are, we are um, happy to do as, as many things as you all want, so we're both pretty um, eager and excited. So <laughs> and if somebody doesn't tell us to back off, we will keep um, doing things and putting stuff out there. I also saw um, somebody mentioned more dance resources, and that is something that I am going to be um, bringing in for sure. So be on the lookout for that. This is only my second week. So we are, we are working on all of that, and we will get you quite a bit. So um, yeah. the I'm trying to find it. Not right this second. It's not coming up. I'm sorry. I'm stressed. We all are, um, sorry, the recording of this session, I will send out the link to it um, in an email because it records who has uh, been here today. And um, yeah, thank you for being here. Oh, and we've heard you say that you need more art specific professional development. Sayward and I are working with. Um, try, or our professional organizations with um, professional organizations uh, or, or dance, let's see, the Carolina Ballet, and we are working with the symphony and the museum to um, provide professional development. And um, it's wonderful having Sayward here because she's been reaching out to the universities uh, to see if we can get you all um, more specific um, content. 
Yeah, definitely that hope um, to be able to get the universities involved in helping you all with some specific arts related professional development is really something that we are interested in doing for you. Can you tell me the link for the survey again? It's not showing in my chat. Oh, sure. Um, I'll do it. Well, there it is. It's bit.ly slash NC learns together arts ed. So I will go ahead and add it onto the slide deck right now. Thank you. So if you um, go to that feedback form on that link, they will send you how to get your certificate to take to your um, administrators and to your school district. So that will all be taken care of um, if you follow that that link. But that has to be done today. That attendance and feedback form has to be filled out today in order for you to get your certificate. We are all done for the day, so um, if you are ready to go, you are more than welcome to hop off and head to your next session. I will say that anyone who is looking for tech help, this NC Learns Together conference is an amazing place for learning about technolo technology that is um, perfect for this online environment.
All right, everyone. Thanks so much for being here today. We're going to go ahead and close the meeting, and I hope that everyone enjoyed it. Please give us a holler if you need anything from us. Um, the link there to be able to put in your polls because we'll be asking some fun questions and we'd like to keep track of that so that you can see what everybody else has said. All right, so again, I'm Sayward Brindley, your dance and visual arts consultant, and um, we have Kelly Schultz here as well, and I'm going to let Brandon say hi and introduce himself. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about there that. You go. My name is Brandon Rader. I am the K-12 Music and Theater Arts Consultant at DPI. I started in September, so for all of you who may not recognize my face, um, glasses, longer hair, you know, that's what happens in quarantine. But um, we, are, we are thrilled to be with you today and also to have our amazing colleague, Ellie Schultz, with us on the call. She is going to do, be helping us by capturing all of your great ideas, and she will be typing them into the slides at the very end of this slide deck. So um, no worries, no need to furiously be copying down your notes um, or taking notes. Uh, she will do it for you, and then you can visit the um, the bit.ly down there at the bottom, um, bit.ly slash we can NC Arts Ed, and um, at any time you can go back and take a look at those. As a bonus, uh, all of the notes from um, yesterday's session are also in there, so you'll be able to read through all of the great ideas that everybody had yesterday during this roundtable conversation. So we just want to give a shout out to Kelly and say thank you so much for helping our tiny little arts ed team um, and for being amazing. Just a few things quickly, make sure that you can hear us. Um, and type in the chat if you cannot. We, we should have closed captioning uh, going on soon, hopefully. Um, and make sure you can see us and ask questions in the chat if you have any. Thank you. You are probably wondering how you can get certificates of participation for this session. So at the end of the session, you do need to stay on for the entire time. You will have a link to complete your attendance and feedback form. You must fill that form out today. And then once you complete it, you will be sent another link that you can use to save or print your certificate. Um, you will send those questions directly to nclearnstogether at gmail.com. We cannot issue those certificates for you. So those credits will be taken, or that certificate will be taken directly to your school or your district, and they will determine all of your uh, credit for professional development. Here is our uh, North Carolina digital learning standard that we are incorporating today that students use technology to seek feedback that informs and improves their practice and to demonstrate their learning in a variety of ways. And you can take a look at all of those standards there on that link as well. A few more things that you do not need video. We are gonna try to stay on topic in the chat and in the uh, group discussion, but go ahead and uh, type away and try to join in as much as possible. We really encourage a lot of participation today because this is for you and to share your ideas. We are going to try to stay solutions focused and think about all of the positive ways that we can approach this new situation and all of the things that we can do right now. Just make sure that you come up here and uh, mute your, um, yourself. And if you decide that you would like to join in, again, you can unmute and just start talking. But if, if you would rather just type share in the chat box, then we will, count, we will call on you.
Great. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Sorry, Sayward. I um, was trying to mute whoever uh, just came on. And um, I am also having a terrible time. I cannot chat. Um, I'm not sure why. I'm going to try to continue to figure that out. Okay. All right. So I will help man the chat today then, if, if that is helpful. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, because it's impossible for 87 of us all to do a, an icebreaker, we decided we'd do um, an icebreaker sort of a different way today. Um, in front of you are 12 zoomed up uh, little bits of famous paintings by famous artists. And so we are going to take just 60 seconds. And if you can grab a scrap sheet of paper, and go ahead and write down A through L right next to it. And then um, when I say go, you're going to try to write down the name of the artist. So um, uh, if, or sorry, and then at the end, we're going to try something um, a little bit different. We're going to use poll everywhere, which I dropped that link into the chat back when I used to be able to chat, but it's poll ev dot com slash brandon r o e d e zero one zero and you'll see it on the next screen as well um with the or when we try to figure out how many answers you got correct so don't give away any answers in the chat yet and your time starts now 60 seconds to name all 12 artists you don't have to name the actual piece You've got about 15 seconds left. All right, five, four, three, two, one, zero. And here are your answers, hopefully. Yep, there you go. Um, Number one is Andy Warhol, of course, and B is, sorry, A is Andy Warhol, B is Frida, C is Pierre Mondrian, D is Da Vinci, E is Van Gogh, um, F is Munch, G is Rockwell, H is Mary Cassette, I is Hokusai, J is O'Keefe, K is Wood, and L is Pablo Picasso. So, um, Sayward was generous enough just to drop the um, poll everywhere link into the chat. And if you could please go, um, we're going to do a poll here. And uh, if you go to the link at the top of the screen here, pollev.com slash Brandon Rhoda 010, then you can choose whichever um, uh, bracket gives you the <laughs> or best describes how many you got correct. All right, nice. Kind of like yesterday, we uh, we had lots of people who got half of them right and lots of people who got all of them right. So wonderful job to everybody. That's awesome. We're gonna stay on this website for just a minute and um, we're gonna go ahead and find out what subject you teach. Oh, some people have already done this, great. Um, so it looks like we have lots of art and music um, participants here. We've got some people who are teaching in the general music classroom, non-arts classroom as well. And so we are we are thrilled to have everyone here as part of this, this conversation. Wow, we're all the way up to 91 people. This is exciting. Look at that changing. That's awesome. Yeah, the 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 difficult part about Polev is that they they separate the words. So if you write elementary music, it separates elementary as one group and music as another group. But that's okay. That's wonderful. 
Awesome. Well, we're going to go ahead and find out what level you teach. Um, so if you can go on to the next poll and share with us what level you teach. Um, other, if you are a, you know, K-8 school or if you are um, post-secondary or only preschool. I see lots of um, answers in the chat. You are welcome to go ahead and respond to this actual poll at pollev.com slash Brandon Rhoda 010. The link is at the top of the screen. Great, lots of elementary school people, but we have a pretty good spread, a pretty good representation across all the grade levels. That's great. Wonderful. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and hand this back over to Sayward. All right, so there's a few things that we're going to talk about today. First, we're going to just give you a little overview of standards-based approach, um, specifically with arts teaching. Um, and some things that we need to look at with remote learning as well. Then we're going to talk about what is working, and that's when we really would like to hear from you, and we want to know, you know, what things have you been doing in your classrooms, what ideas do you have, and really um, let this share and be an open dialogue. So again, there you can just unmute and share, or if you prefer to just type share into the chat, and we will call on you and um, give you time to share that. And then we'll talk about the next steps for moving forward, how you can get in touch with us, um, some other resources that we have provided for you, and then closure again with our contact information. So the first thing that we're going to talk about with our standards-based approach, so really using those standards in all four of your arts disciplines to create your lessons. And you're already doing that in your classrooms on a regular basis, but you're probably focusing on a couple of particular standards more often than others. Um, I'm coming from the dance background and I'm also a visual artist. So I know that typically we work a lot on technique and skills and performing, but there's a lot of other standards that, you know, sometimes get put on the back burner that are just as equally important and valid. And when we're remote learning, sometimes those might be some of the standards that we have time to actually dive into and get a little bit deeper. But think for a moment, take inventory, which ones have you really had a chance to cover and which ones would you like to maybe go a little bit deeper into as far as art analysis, you know, of different visual arts, performing arts, um, all of these different ideas here. So thinking about those standards, which ones have you not had a chance to cover on uh, deeply yet? I just want to hop in for a second. We, um, Marla was sharing that, uh, she's redesigned her curriculum to include more music appreciation and that it feels a little co counterproductive. But um, I just want to point out the fact that there are no choir standards. There are no band standards. There are music standards for high school. And so those parts of art or like musical analysis and response and contextual relevancy are just as important um, as the art making or the music making process. We appreciate difficult music because we understand the theory and the context behind it. And sometimes we forget that when our students don't have that theory or that context behind it, they don't actually value it as much. So we can increase um, their ability to understand and value the music that they're performing when we address a lot of those other standards. So they are not counterproductive, I promise you. They're just as equally important. So we want to encourage you that instead of trying to replace what you were doing in the classroom before, simply by using technology and doing that at home, think about what you can do differently now and what opportunities are now open to using these different ways of learning and different ways of conducting class uh, remotely. As educators, we are so used to these unexpected interruptions and we adjust, we change course, we adapt right? We take obstacles that are thrown at us. And we figure out how to not only navigate through them, but how to use them to make something even better. So an example would be, you know, I, uh, for Earth Day, I took my own children outside. We did um, 
we did a walk around and a scavenger hunt collected materials and we created self portraits using natural materials that we had found outside and so that's just one thing that you could use as as an example um, in dance you might be thinking about site specific movement or weight sharing with walls or objects right or how a confined space might change the interpretation of the movement of, of the dance or how being outside in in a grassy field would change the movement as well so when you're surveying your students you want to think about what resources do they have at home technology but then also otherwise do they have instruments for them do they have art supplies do they have accessibility to art to be able to analyze um, you know, do they need photocopies of things or can they access it on the internet? Do they have uh, the ability to listen to music through either CD players or the internet? All of these things you want to think about. Space to dance, maybe giving them a list of things to think about when making sure that their space is safe to move in. Make sure there's no rugs in the way or furniture and all of that kind of thing. So you can create a list so that they're aware and they create that safe space for them right away. I know my son's art teacher did this with creating an art space for them to work in and gave us a list of things to think about to create this studio. And then also what resources do you have to be able to, con to create your lessons and give those to your students? So if you're gonna be recording yourself teaching, making sure that you have the video and audio recording equipment you need, you know how to upload those things. But if you don't have that, then maybe you need to think of another way to get your information and your content to your students. So you wanna consider these um, frameworks that NCDPI and the Friday Institute have created, the Instructional Design Principles for Remote Teaching and Learning. And so all of these categories in this circle here are really important things to think about when creating and designing your lessons, right? So um we want to click on that brandon do you want to talk about this for a second or do you want me to sure i've spent quite a lot of time with it um yeah. so i just love the fact that amy was sharing that choice in um art making has been a really in, you know important part of her classroom and um and that's actually one of the things that is recommended by this um, framework and so if we go to the instructional um Okay, good, everybody can see it. The Instructional Design Principles for Remote Teaching and Learning, DPI and the Friday Institute were actually way ahead of the, of the nation by putting this, um, this framework together. From what I've been able to glean by talking to other arts educators across the nation, or sorry, arts um, consultants across the nation that most states do not have any sort of framework like this. Um, as being, a past online student and online teacher myself, I will say that these, I feel like, hit all of the things that I would want to do for my students and I would want an instructor to do for me. Um, this website is really easy to understand. The graphic, I think, is a really easy thing to point out to any sort of administrator and sort of a reminder. And, and it's really, um, takes the things that are important and gives you actionable steps that you can use to and ideas of how to address all of these things in the remote learning environment. Please note that this says remote learning environment and not digital education environment. So even though I was speaking as an online learner, um, these things are still imperative and completely able to be done um, using snail mail or the telephone or even, um, you know, visits with the proper uh, distance between you and a student. So um, the the seven points are there. And um, down here at the bottom of this page is the complete report, which I believe is only six pages long. It's, it's not excessive considering how many points are there. Uh, there's a one page summary in the middle and then there's a graphic if you'd like to um, download that, print it, make a reminder for yourself. Um, I do wanna point out underneath these related resources, there are recommendations for instructional leaders, and we'll go ahead and visit that as well. Um, the Friday Institute and NCDPI released these at the same time, and these are ways for your instructional leaders to support you as educators. So in the same way that we want to provide choice for our students, we should be able to provide some choice for our um, for our staff members in the same way that we need to have flexible deadlines because internet goes out or a lack of supplies or family emergencies uh, for our students we need to provide 
flexibility for those employees as well. So if this is something that would benefit you with your relationship with your instructional leaders, please be aware of this as um, an official NCDPI resource that is, is welcome to be shared. Again, at the bottom of this page um, are the downloads of the full paper, giving the um, rationale of how they even came to this all the way through the one page summary and the graphic again. Great, yeah, and um, yesterday there was a lot of talk about including those SEL components and that that is one of those sections among that. And there's really, you know, this this is a great opportunity to be teaching our, our students about resilience and how to be flexible and creative and those creative and critical thinking skills, um, how to work through problems and how to create something amazing from something that seems like an obstacle. So we really want to model that and, and really use that positive language and affirmative language that we can teach remotely temporarily. We are cautious of sending any message that the arts are unable to be taught remote or at a reduced capacity. We do not want people to think that, that we're not able to do this, right? So we need to really be positive with our language that we use with ourselves, with our students, families, administrators, colleagues, and in our community and things that we're putting out on social media. So we wanna be really cautious and talking about what are all of the things that we can accomplish now and what is possible in this new way of thinking about the arts and this, this field of education. Um, teaching remotely is better than not teaching at all. So really promoting your successes and what is working. Highlight it, share it, announce it from the world. You know. So that's what we're Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say in our world of hashtags, um, you know, you are welcome to tag or use the at to the State Board of Education or your legislator or um, Arts at NC or whatever um, your school district is. Let everyone who is a decision maker who influences your program um, see the wonderful things that you're doing with your program, even in these challenging times. And so um, we're going to move on to uh, what is working um, and we're going to kind of think about, you know, what are some things that you are doing? What's working for you in your classrooms? What ideas do you have that you would like to try out um, and go from there? I'm sorry, I am all over the place, but I did get chat back, so that's good. So um, in order to know how to best drive our conversation forward, we are going to go ahead and have another poll. Uh, not a fishing poll, but a North Pole this time. So if you could go back to pollev.com slash Brandon Rhoda 010. Um, we have five different priorities that we have heard from the field are things that want to be discussed at length. So um, if you can start sharing these, or sorry, ranking these, um, we can drive the conversation. This conversation will probably end up being different than yesterday's conversation based on the desires of the people here. Um, oh my, it just went to zero. Oh, there we go. We'll let it go ahead and go for just a little bit longer. Oh yeah, it's reshuffling like crazy. <laughs> All right. So um, again, I want to remind you that our amazing colleague, Kelly Schultz, is capturing as much as she can from our conversation and from the chat box um, and writing those great ideas that you are sharing um, you know, in, in the slides at the end of this presentation. Uh, again, that, that link is at the bottom of all of the regular slides. I couldn't put it on these dynamic slides, um, but that is bit.ly slash we can NC arts ed. And, um, and anything that you drop into the chat of the great things that you're doing or the um, 
or any of the ideas that we share today are going to be recorded. So you don't need to frantically take any sort of notes. Um, so it looks like we're here mostly to get some new ideas and to imagine some fall scenarios, um, perhaps to address the lack of supplies, um, if we can get around to it. Um, we'll say that performance ensembles, theater, band, choral, choir, and orchestra, et cetera, um, I'll speak to that really quickly, that there are um, hopefully guidelines forthcoming soon about how those sorts of things can continue, uh, even in, in the fall, whether it's in person or online. And um, to share your success, I guess that's hopefully what we're going to, how we're going to get some new ideas. So hopefully that'll kind of be rolled into the first one. So um, let's go ahead and start. If you feel like you have um, something to uh, something to share, um, you are welcome to go ahead and either drop it into the chat, and I will happily read it out. Or um, if if you'd like to write the word share, we'll go ahead and call on you so that we can try to keep this fairly um, orderly. So uh, Deborah is telling us that Flipgrid and Google Class are you still asking for more information? Really, you must well. not have anything. It's killing time. We've done thirty minutes of polling. Um, so we are. Uh, sorry. So Deborah is telling us that Flipgrid and Google Classroom are really good. Um, the North Carolina Museum of Art has integrated a Google Classroom button into um, their all of their online resources. If you have something to add into your Google Classroom, you're more than or that's a really easy integration. And I know that the North Carolina Symphony is trying to work on getting their um, virtual technology to be integrated with Google Classroom as well. Um, Awesome. Heather is sharing that Flipgrid talent shows are really popular. If you're unfamiliar with Flipgrid, basically what happens is somebody records a two minute video up to two minute video, and then you can record responses to it. So you could ask your students to give a critique or a positive response or just any sort of response to it um, whatsoever. Um, let's see. Screencastify, that's true. Yeah, if um, you are trying to explain any sort of new technology to your students, actually taking a lesson to specifically teach the technology instead of um, just asking them to integrate it into what their art making process is. We've talked a lot about that um, both yesterday in, and in previous meetings how it's important to take time to teach the actual technology separate from the art making process. Hmm. If anybody wants to um, speak out, you are welcome to unmute yourself and share. Yes, yeah, feel free to, to go ahead and join in. I'm going to actually share one lesson um, that a dance teacher shared with me yesterday that said I could share it with you all. She's a middle school dance teacher in Wake County, Sue Hill, and um, she did her final dance project that's normally a group choreography project touching on the four elements of dance, space, time, energy, um, and she decided to have her students write a document as though they were a famous choreographer proposing choreography to big dance companies. And so they had to go through and create um, and she has a whole document that I can share with you if you would like access to it. But they had to write about what their dance would be about, how many dancers they would use, what music and why they chose that, um, how long their dance would be, and then choreograph and discuss the choreographic elements and write it out and describe how they would choreograph it and how many dancers and which elements of dance they would use. The choreographic form they had to draw out on the stage where the dancers could be, right? So they're not actually physically choreographing it, but they're choreographing it in their brain. And she said there was no um, there was no limit to what they could use as far as costumes and signs and all of that. So 
So there's a whole um, nine step process that, that she has and she said I think there will be Whitney Bridge process um, because it is in her Google Classroom. So I'm gonna share that with you um, in just a moment and you can take a look at that. But I thought it was a really neat two week project that incorporated writing and every single standard um, in, in this one project. So um, several people in the chat have been talking about um, uh, using Zoom game, oh, sorry, Zoom to do drama games. Um, and they're also letting Sayward know that her audio is going in and out unless she's looking straight at the mic. So, um, um, but if I, I think it was Valerie and Julie W who shared that they were doing um, drama games on Zoom. If you are willing to share, uh, unmute yourself and share with the group, I'm sure that's something that any of the performing arts can um, learn from. Um, hi, this is Julie, Julie W. Um, so drama games are always super popular and important I have found for all age levels and I've tried to adapt a bunch of them so that we could do them in my drama green rooms as I've called our zoom sessions um, every simple stuff like where in the world is so and so one student names um, somebody else in the class where in the world is Courtney and everybody has to strike a dramatic pose pointing in the direction of that person on their grid um, because that's different for everybody. Uh, it gets kids moving, it gives them some um, ownership over the lesson because they can take charge. Um, we've played games like life is good, um, life is good for anyone who and you say something that's true about you, and if it's true for somebody else, then you can type me too into the chat, and the last person to get in there is the next it. So physical stuff, um, group building, dynamic stuff, creative stuff. Um, I've done some scavenger hunts. Go find something that you can eat that's smaller than uh, quarter or something and they have to go find it and bring it back and then tell a story about it or say it is a, a penny they can't say this is a penny they have to cook up some other use for it so giving them a creative challenge that way so those are just a few ideas I've also done a scavenger hunt this is about sorry this is Valerie I teach at IC Imagine Public Charter School in Asheville um, but I've also done the scavenger hunt where they find something on a countdown that they can use as, for example, a wig or a costume piece. Um, we also play charades a lot. And all of my classes always enjoyed the word at a time story. So we have done that as well. And they really, really like that one. That's the one we play the most. Um, but yeah, we, uh, we've, we love our Zoom sessions. They're a lot of fun. So it sounds like you haven't been slowed down at all. That's awesome. Um, I will say that things that I've heard from the field um, that empower students like that are always really um, big hits and get a lot of student participation. I was speaking with a, a high school orchestra teacher and he was telling me that even all of his seniors were highly engaged and participated in his assignment where they had to teach him some sort of musical orchestral concept. Um, so it was pretty broad. He didn't even give them like, this is how you teach a lesson or write a lesson plan. It was, you know, your assignment is to teach me any sort of element of music of your choice. And um, he said that his students were super into it and demonstrated a lot of mastery of um, musical concepts. So, um, Nina had asked if anyone has suggestions on how to create a gallery of student work. I know that the entire state of Washington um, did their 
um, like Department of Ed gallery um, online. I will try to go find that link and share it in the um, chat, but hopefully every or a lot of other people can share here um, what they've done for their classrooms or their schools galleries. Feel free to unmute yourself. So it seems like there's lots of um, responses um, like Padlet and Google Slides, Artzonia, Flipgrid, um, and lots and lots of uh, uh, Google Slides. All right, so I did find the Washington State one. Uh, it looks like it's just a um, a website that has all the all the pictures um, and the artist ID, the title, the medium, and the student inspiration. So it looks like a lot of um, building of of websites. Again, this is this conversation is um, going to be driven by you guys. So feel free to speak up. All right. Well, one of the other uh, is anybody else looking for specific ideas before we move on to imagining fall scenarios? All right. Yeah, we can address the lack of supplies. So um, Rochelle is asking um, for no art supplies at home, and Julie Bauer is asking for ideas for elementary music. So we'll uh, tackle art supplies. We've got using food or outdoor materials. I know Sayward took her entire family outside and um, used found objects and made some beautiful art that they posted on, on um, Facebook. Um, somebody earlier had said that they use kitchen liquids in order to paint with. So I imagine that means things like ketchup, mustard, mayonnaise, and uh, more viscous fluids, but oh, coffee, awesome. Yogurt. Yogurt, that's great. Food coloring, excellent. Yeah. Yogurt and Cool Whip make perfect paint. Yogurt and Cool Whip, that's awesome. I love that. Kelly's definitely gonna capture that for you all. Making a drum and doing a percussion lesson. Great. Yeah, let's go ahead and just start dropping things into the chat for how you address any of uh, the lack of supplies for any um, any uh, discipline. So I hear, see I, milk for glue and shaving cream. Sorry, go ahead. Somebody else? I have a question for you. I teach two schools. And how would I do a... Um, like a Google Meet or something like that with that many children? Uh, so my daughter has her classes or has four classes a day. And um, I know that she is meeting with her entire class, um, you know, of, because they are a split class with two educators. So they have 40 kids and the PE teacher, uh, you know, handles that all by himself. But um I think that the most important thing to do is to, number one, teach the technology separately. Um, so the the whole utilization of of the Google Meet and making sure that everyone is um, is aware of how to mute themselves and why we mute yourselves and all of that stuff. Uh, making sure. Like how do I sign them up? Oh, how do you sign them up? Yeah, because I have almost over a thousand kids. Okay, so well, I would. So a Google Meet is just a session, 
Um, and then what you could do is create yourself a spreadsheet and put all the create a hyperlink schedule. Um, and then everybody would just like click on maybe their homeroom teacher's name. Um, and then that would come up as, as your Google session. Um, so you would have to create a different Google meet room basically for each of those. But when you go into the settings, you can do it as a recur reoccurring meeting, um, or an open room that you can hyper. Brandon. Yeah. One of the things I've done is I have a, a live Zoom Kabuki makeup session coming up, which we're actually applying Kabuki makeup using things that are in their house. And um, I live and breathe by Sign Up Genius. So I have created um, slots for those kids to go in and I drop the link or G Suite School. So I drop the link in their Google Classroom and they go in and sign up. And that, that has worked really well. I also have independent Zoom sessions for each one of my um, classes and those are the days that only those students are allowed to go to those classes or only those meetings um, now i only have 70 students i don't have a thousand students but <laughs> i have found that sign up genius is really i did have about um between cast and crew for our spring musical about 200 families to coordinate so i use sign up genius for that as well and it works i, I love sign up genius it works amazingly so that i have found that to be very successful can you, like, we have to use Canvas, so can you just load the link into it and say, this time we'll be on? Yes. yes you should yeah. be able to. Yeah, you should be able to, because we don't, I don't use Canvas, some of our teachers do, but I do know that they put Sign Up Genius links in as well as the, like, the class links, like the Zoom or the Meet or whatever you use links. Okay. Thanks for your help. So um, I'm going to go ahead and, ooh, I don't know if I can show, let's see. Um, I was trying to show something else, but I'm not sure if I can. Is that gonna work? No, Never mind. Okay, um, I was just gonna try and show what my daughter's school had done with that, but it sounds like you've got it taken care of. So creating relevancy when we're told to step back and allow students to focus on the regular classroom assignments. Um, I would argue that it is in uh, national policy for ESSA that uh, it's written that music and the arts are part of a balanced curriculum. And in our state, um, the arts are supposed to be taught in every um, school at every grade level. So. Uh, I I would be concerned about that, but um, one of the I, sorry oh, I didn't mean to interrupt, but no. one of the um, great things about my school is we are fine arts focused school. So from grades six through twelve, they have to focus in either theater, chorus, band, or visual arts. Um, but our fine arts department chair in her infinite snarkiness, which I really admire because I'm from the Midwest, said, well, where has everybody turned during this time? We've all turned to the arts um, to find comfort and relief and humor and all of that. So she made that point. Of course, I'm, I'm not in any danger of losing my, my school or my job because like I said, we're a fine arts focused school, but it was it was kind of a relief like some of the the county schools were like struggling. And so one of my friends actually went back to her school and told her principal, where are people turning? She used that on on the principal. And the principal's like, you know what, you're right. So I was like, woo, go, go arts, <laughs> go arts people. That's extremely relevant right now. So as a general education English teacher, <laughs> um, social emotional learning is so big right now. And we're That's really good. trying to put that into English language arts in every constant area. Well, there you go. Just the point you made is a perfect example. Reach out to your English teachers. You could collaborate with them on so many different projects and things for the students. Um, so just speaking from my ELA lens specifically, but go the avenue of the social emotional learning in the content areas, which obviously arts is a part of that. So. Um, that's just my suggestion. Definitely reach out to your ELA teachers. Oh yeah, our ELA teachers and I have a very close relationship because theater and ELA are so closely related and that. So, but yeah, you're absolutely right. And and there's power in numbers. So. Well, sometimes we forget that ELA stands for English Language Arts. Um, so exactly. that is why we are so closely aligned. Also, if you're trying to teach any sort of um, music history and you are in the elementary level, um, or art history or dance history or theater history, you 
Absolutely. I know in fifth grade, they like do research projects. So why not do a research project on a famous, instead of just like a famous person, it's a famous arts person. I know that's what I used to do in my A plus school. Um, but I was going to say that the, the big hot ticket item right now is social emotional learning. And um, the arts are absolutely at the forefront of that. We never stopped meeting the SEL needs of our kids during Race to the Top or North, uh, sorry, North, No Child Left Behind. Um, so it's something that we, I feel like, are already leading the charge. Um, I will drop a link here to um, the National Association for Music Educators did a wonderful um, SEL brochure that I feel like is, is very easy to um, understand even if you're a non-arts person um, and the oh where is it okay but the um, the music community especially NAFME I feel like is is leading that charge right now for the arts I'm currently reading um, several books about SEL or the intersection between SEL and the arts. Um, and those links actually are already in yesterday's notes if you go to the, um, to the slides. But um, yeah, the, uh, they are also coming up with, I think, two more SEL webinars um, that are going to be broadcasted for free that you can go learn from. A lot of the special guests are from the broader arts education SEL community. And so they speak to um, many different art forms, not just music. Um, but as so many of us know, we all intersect in so many different ways that if you go to a dance session, you're going to learn something as a visual artist. Or if you go to a music, thing, um, you're going to learn something as a theater person. So. I'm going to uh, just chime in with that when you talk about the research project, you know, uh, from a personal example, my daughter's in fourth grade and they were doing um, language arts and social studies. Um, they had to do a research project on a famous woman from history. So my daughter is interested in dance. So she chose Isadora Duncan and did this whole research project and created a PowerPoint presentation as a fourth grader about Isadora Duncan and then not even as part of the, the project on her own decided she wanted to go outside and create a dance that was inspired by Isadora Duncan's movement. And so she's like creating this dance inspired by everything she learned and she said to me, Mommy, I've done one of these every year and this is the first one I actually liked doing. <laughs> so she, um, I think, and I asked her why and she said because it was just somebody that I was actually interested in at this point. And so she, she just wrote so much more. We've had problems with her even being engaged with that previously. And this time it was, she was excited every day to get working on it. So I think, you know, finding those ways to, to make those connections to the subjects they're already doing, this time, this gives them something that they're super, super interested in and relates to, again, that social emotional piece also. Which I'll say, um, we should be doing even when we're in brick and mortar as well, uh, when we can integrate uh, both art standards into the non-arts classroom and non-art standards into the arts classroom, we actually allow our students to see how the arts are related to all of the world um, instead of just when they go to that specialist class. Um, and then I just wanted to call something else out from the chat. I know a lot of people are um, struggling to get their students to their regular non-arts classes. I, I see that all over social media. Um, all of my teacher friends. So a lot of people have started having special guests and they tell the kids, oh, we're going to have a special guest on Wednesday. And then they all show up and then they find out it's the arts teacher, you know, and they're super excited about it. And they're all going to, you know, um, create this wonderful art project or um, be challenged to create a 16 bar uh, two instrument ostinato piece with found percussive instruments in the house, you know? Um, and and so those have been um, greatly successful at increasing the participation in the regular ed 
classroom teachers um, classes because they never know what they're going to get. So um, I'm conscious of time and we have six minutes left. So we'd love to share with you some supports that um, DPI is um, going through. So I'm going to go ahead and um, kick this back to Sayward. All right, so um, there are several things that you can do next steps moving forward. Um, we have an arts ed sharing Facebook group that you can go on and share ideas and look at some of the things on there. Remote learning page that you can go that has ideas for high and low tech options. And if you have additional ideas that you think we could add to that, you are welcome to send those to us and we can weed through those as well. Um, those are just a couple of ideas that we have on there. And we tried to really make sure that there are some that are low tech, but remote options. And then we have a Google Classroom share space where you can go on by discipline and share lesson plans that you have, things that you've done. You can go and look at what other teachers are sharing, borrow lessons and adapt and tweak. I know somebody mentioned that earlier. Is there a place that we can do that? And this is a great, great opportunity for you to go in and, and share things with each other. Um, so really uh, take a look at that and those codes. Um, Brandon's going to tell you a little, little tidbit with it, a little tip mm -hmm. with how to get into these because some people are saying that the codes are not working for them. So as um, everybody transitioned to remote learning, it seems that most districts across the state tightened up their securities. So a lot of uh, districts cannot enroll in courses outside their own districts. So um, if you cannot get into this class, there are two reasons and neither one of them, or sorry, there are two possible solutions and, and neither one of them is that it's a wrong code. Um, the first solution is to contact your tech department and ask them to please allow you to enroll in Google Classrooms from the at dpi.nc.gov domain. That's that end part of our email addresses uh, in case you forget. Um, or the very simple and immediate um, workaround is to sign up with a Google account that is not your school account. So if you sign up with a personal Google account, uh, there should be no issue whatsoever. And that's how the majority of people who have already gotten into the Google Classrooms have signed up with a non-school um, Google Classroom account. So again, if you have any problems, feel free to email one of us and we are happy to remind you what those two options are. But um, the codes are all correct. You just have to either whitelist the DPI domain for Google Classroom, or you have, which is a which is a uh, instructional technology like department. Your your IT people have to do that. It's not something you can do. Um, or you need to sign up with your own personal Google account. And though we recognize that that is um, possibly an impediment for some people, we still wanted to provide it as an option for those participants who can use it. And if you do sign up with your own personal account and let's say, you know, you ever have to switch schools or something, you still have access to all of those materials and you, you, you have that with you. So we also would like to know how we can support you. We love your input. We love your feedback. We, you know, do you want coaching and feedback from us? Any of that um, resources that we can share with you or that you're looking for, feel free to email us, follow up with any additional questions that you have. Um, you can reach out. We've already gotten a few emails after yesterday of people asking very specific questions. So there's a lot of you that teach a lot of different subjects and, and levels across this. Uh, webinar. And so if you have something that's more specific to your needs that you would like to reach out to us individually, we are happy to um, brainstorm with you, answer questions, you know, help you bounce ideas, um, any of that. Um, also, you know, spaces to connect with each other. We, you know, we're interested in, in uh, creating some of these that might happen monthly or with your individual disciplines. And if that's something that you're interested in getting involved in and being a part of so that you can share uh, information on a regular basis and let us know. And then um, other things that you, that you might have uh, an interest in or think that we can support you with, please let us know.
All right, so again, um, here are some of the things that were chatted. Oh, we're gonna skip no, I'm that. sorry, we're gonna move forward because I'm cognizant of the time. Okay. Um, gotcha. th these are our um, uh, contact information. I'll come back to this, um, but just wanted to move forward and let you know that in order for you to get your CEUs, you must go to this survey, um, which is written in tiny letters in, uh, in the middle of your screen there, or I've I will continue to drop it into the chat. Um, and once you finish that survey, you will get two links. One of them goes to a PDF um, certificate and the other one goes to a Google Slides certificate. So if you um, want to be able to type in your name, make sure that you download the Google Slides certificate. And, um, and then you need to save that as a PDF or some other format printed out in order to take it to your um, LEA so that they can determine how to give you continuing ed credits. So um, there's that. And then right after that slide it are all the meeting notes where Kelly has been taking amazing notes this entire time. Um, and you can go back and everything is hyperlinked there. And I will um, go ahead and end us on this Thank you slide with our contact information and um, please go ahead and feel free to uh, finish or sorry fill out that um, survey at that link and Brandon oh, that link takes us to yesterday's okay. to Wednesday okay um, all right if uh, you have to go I will try to email this out to everybody um, if you can stay, I will try to fix that and get you to the right link right now. I can stay because I'm on another device for my next class. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you all so much for joining us and feel free to reach out again if you have any questions or ideas or just want to brainstorm or chat. I will have it for you in about three seconds. All right, guys, this should be the correct um, link here. It's not pretty, but there you go. <laughs> bit.ly slash 2xfvhr4. The title of this session is Standards Based Online Instruction. Arts, online arts instruction. I put the link in the chat. All right, folks, we're going to go ahead. Brandon. Uh, yes, Karen. Please repeat that. Please, please repeat for me the survey link. Sure. I didn't hear you. So I'm get, okay. Are you unable to see it in the chat? Yes, I am. I'm unable. Okay. Sure. It is bit, so B I T dot L Y slash two capital X capital F capital V lowercase A. Capital what? V as in Victor. Okay. 
and then lowercase h, lowercase r, and then four. Okay, so we have https colon forward slash forward slash bit dot ly forward slash the number two capital X capital X capital V H R lowercase four the number. Yeah, I actually just updated it on the slides. So if you are still able to see the slides, it's it's now written there. Oh, it's on the Oh, good. Thank you. I can see that. Thank you. Let me get that. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yvonne, you asked for it in the uh, chat, and it is there. Go ahead and feel free to click on it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for being here today. We really truly appreciate getting to hear from the field and uh, get a feel for what you guys are looking for and what you need. All right, folks, I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting for everyone, but thank you so much for being here today. Uh, Mackenzie, I will, uh, the, the survey um, that's written in the middle of this um, attendance and feedback uh, page should be the, the one that is correct. It's the, this one right here that I'm dropping into the chat. You're very welcome.